So, good evening. I can say good evening, it's relatively late. So, uh, looking at the program, we are supposed to be at, at, at the Apero now at networking. I'm sorry, so you will have to, to wait a little bit, and, but I hope you will have some, um, some interest in what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, so as uh, you, and thank you for the invitation and the opportunity for the organizers to give me this opportunity to speak with you about where we are, about our reflection. So I'm speaking on behalf of the industry and FPA today, and um, we had some reflections about IMI, what we have been doing, and what we, know that we know that there are three years remaining now, and we were thinking what's going to happen within the next three years. So before that, I'd like to give you the background. Okay? Where is the industry and what is the context today? So first, sometimes we tend to forget that, and we saw some numbers earlier by Ian presentation. So pharma industry is investing a lot in research and development, the, the largest. If you look at all the sectors, we are the largest investors because it's critical for us. Innovation is critical and science is critical for us. So it's up to 14% in average. So some companies go up to 20% of their, of their sales, net sales into R&D, which is a lot. Now, we continue to create jobs, particularly in Europe as well. And this is very important. If you look at the other sectors, some and very few are creating jobs, most of them not. So Europe has not been doing well in the economy over the past 10 years. But despite that moment, you know, we have in the industry been able to continue to create jobs. Now, let's look at some positive uh, aspects of, where, of our environment. So what, what do we see uh, happening? Rapid uh, development of the science and technology. It was not expected some 10, 15 years ago. Where there was in the press this kind of skepticism about how innovative pharma industry is in bringing new targets, new drugs. We have been surprised over the past five to 10 years now. This is not the case. We have, this is, that was really positively surprising us. So, the, so the, the, ch the change also comes from the evolution of some new technologies. And now we are facing a big change in pharma, which is the digital health. And that's not an area where we are good at. So if you compare to banking and all the other sectors, we are very slow in integration of, those, uh, of the digital uh, revolution, probably because of the regulatory, uh, regulated environment. But this is coming now. And uh, I, saw, I see some people nodding. Maybe we are conservative as well, so, and by, by tradition. And I'll come back to that. So, so, but this is something that is happening now, and we have to face, face that and be prepared for the transformation of our, our, our business. Now, the increase of R&D expenditure so was mentioned earlier. And we can debate about the numbers, but um, it definitely has uh, grown and to a point that it's difficult to think about as how a small company can, can make it up. Some large company can still survive uh, some of those costs, but we don't know whether that's sustainable for a long time. So this is a big hurdle for us. So that's getting into not the positive, more on the negative side. Now on the positive side, the patient-centric approach, we, that was not in our radar screen uh, as it is now in the past decades. This is changing now. We are engaging patients in, uh, in our conversations and in our way of doing drug development. Within IMI, there are a lot of projects around patients, and we will hear some of that tomorrow. But so there are some radical changes here that we have to be prepared for. But what we can see, some of the, within the next five years, we can see some of the fruits from those innovations coming up. And CAR T is already there, so we probably heard all about that, that the first CAR T cell approach has been approved in the US um, in September, end of, end of August, and we hope that in Europe we'll have the next uh, CARs being approved next year. So this is really a transformation in our field, in our business, and that opens the door to gene therapy, cell therapy, and we can think that there's a before and after CAR T's as we were talking about today. This is a, a revolution and we will see some transformations that are coming up to that. So combination, in oncology you can see that. One drug is not sufficient, we need to combine drugs. One, two, maybe more. So this is something that we have started to do. We hope that modifying Alzheimer therapies and having treatments that are going to impact the disease which is costing a lot to society, it's difficult for the patients, it's difficult for the families, so this is a big burden. We hope that within the next five years, we'll see something, some light, that there will be some treatments that are going to stop the disease or potentially reverse it. And I'll come back to that in a minute. The other issue that we hope that we can see some, uh, some uh, evolution is the antimicrobial resistance. And we hope that we'll have some drugs for this spreading of this, uh, of, of this issue in Europe and also in the world. 
Now, what, we, we, what are we going to do and where we see the, uh, from the industry some big transformations? So we'll see this discussion about personalized medicine becoming a reality. It is a reality in, in oncology now. It's probably as well in the infectious disease arena and hopefully will grow into other fields. It could be in type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer, etc. Now, I mentioned Alzheimer here in the slide about diagnostic. What we have started to do in IMI is one project called EPAD or other projects, you know, and better understanding Alzheimer. So we will move from trying to stop the disease when it's probably too late to intervene much earlier. This is what we call disease interception. And there's a lot of hope that not only for Alzheimer's disease, but for a lot of diseases, if you start very early on, you may have a chance to just stop the disease and cure the people. So this would, would need a change and a better understanding in some of the disease progression in the very early stage, some biomarkers identification, but also some of the environment and the ecosystem with the regulatory environment that has to evolve. How can you treat patients who are not really patients yet, who are asymptomatic? This is where we are going. This is the kind of conversation that we have started to have within the industry, but also with IMI. We have some projects that are really looking at that now. And you'll come back to that. And antimicrobial arsenal is also something to discuss. You probably all heard about CRISPR and CRISPR technology. This will have an impact that we will be able to modify genes, modify some, just change the genes, make them, in a, in a, stop them to be active or reactivate some genes. So this, this is coming, so from one way or the other. Peptide immunotherapy, checkpoint stimulators, a lot of arsenals that we could, could, we could explore in the future. So this is reassuring that there, there's a lot to do. However, are we ready? Do we have all the resources? Do we have all the skills? Do we have the infrastructure to be able to achieve that for the patients? That's the main, the main question. And here's what Natalie was referring to earlier, the drug development process. And if you just focus on the upper, upper part, do I have uh, yeah. So, If you go to the, just look at the upper part here. So it starts with research, then we have the product development, and product available for patients. And you see the time frame. That's why I mentioned this question about timing. This is not something that happens overnight. It takes a lot of time, a long time to get a drug to patients. Now, we have a lot of attrition. Still, this has not really changed a lot. We mentioned 10,000, whatever the number is, it's a large attrition from research to get one product you know, that gets into the patients. We, we have not learned a lot. IMI has contributed a lot in this phase here. We, have, we are doing a, a lot of activities to try to de-risk some of those activities and expedite the processes, but this is largely uh, a problem for the industry. But anyway, so the timing is very important for us, and the reason we have been successful so far is because we had some support from some of the tools that are existing in the different uh, legislation, the different countries. So those are the patent protections. So without patent protections, you cannot do anything. So those large investments that are being made here, you need to, be recu you need to recoup them from one or the other. And I won't get into the numbers. You probably all heard about those. How much do you get at the end? How much return on investment do you have? It's, it's important to have a protection. And so there are different protections. So the patent, you know, which is 20 years, stops here. We have some adding, adding value here. There are some um, incentives that are related to pediatrics and orphan drugs. So I can just focus on the orphan drug. Since the Orphan Drug Act has been put in place, there, there's much more investment in the orphan diseases. So this is just an, an, an obvious one. So we, we need to improve our processes here. We need to maintain and develop some new incentives. This is critical. Is this going to be enough? Probably not. We need something else. And the something else is probably this ecosystem of public-private partnership. And that's what we were discussing as the industry. And to do so, we came to this point of think big. So how bigger could we think now from the industry perspective to leverage the IMI opportunity, at least for the next uh, re three remaining years? So what we did, we had a, a brainstorming and we engaged our global heads of R&D for that process. And you know, IMI was mainly driven by scientists, and it was more a bottom-up approach, people coming with proposals, discussing with academics, and those proposals were going through the, the process of uh, IMI, as you know. Now, we wanted to have our heads of R&D being accountable and responsible for the deliverables. So to do so, we organized a workshop, and we asked them, what are we going to do with the, rem the, the money that is being left now for IMI, 850 million 
left from the uh, public side, and we are supposed to commit with 900 million as in kind from the industry. So we had extensive brainstorming, and I will show you the process later, but we ended up with four major areas. AMR, antimicrobial resistance, immunology, digital health, and modernization of clinical trials. And I will give you some details about that in a second. So the process was done in a very expedited way. We had the first workshop in March this year, so we have invited the commission to join us with uh, selected heads of R&Ds. We had more than we, we were expected to have in the room. Some were connected on the phone or video conference. So Pierre was joining us. I think you, you, were, you were there as, as well. So we, we, are, we had a large panel of people to, to think about what, what do we need to do now. And so we had a, a, long, list, a, long, li a long list of uh, potential areas. And that list has been further prioritized by the group of heads of R&D, extended group of heads of R&D, now impacting all heads of R&D, including those who are not in the room. And we have asked to those guys, and so it, we ended up with four projects. We asked to the heads of R&D to take now ownership and organize a workshop to be done. And that was when we announced to them by end of April that they have, this group of people have volunteered, you know, and I can mention them, you know, from Sanofi, Roche, Janssen, GSK, Pfizer, and Novartis, to organize a workshop before mid-July this year. So that was end of April. And the idea was that they, each of them would run a workshop on the four categories that I mentioned, and they would mobilize the experts from the industry and the top level of the industry. So that was a very short period of time, but we knew that with this level of uh, leadership, it would be possible, and indeed, it happened. So all the workshops, actually, sometimes two workshops have been, in, in, uh, have been uh, taking place. And um, so and the, the purpose was to develop topics, so based on the four areas that we have identified. So those topics have been refined, and between now and uh, uh, 8th of November, you know, we are supposed to get those topics really finalized. The next phase will be the consultation and, uh, with IMI advisory bodies, and that will get into the IMI process, as you know. So now the question is, what are these, those topics? And um, so first, immunology. And I will go into uh, one level of granularity later. So the first one on immunology is two, and there are multiple projects. We will start now and prioritize two out of the four, of the, of the five, actually, from immunology. One is treatment of non-response and remission. It's a big issue for the industry. We are testing a lot of drugs. We see a lot of responders, but we see many more non-responders sometimes. And, and we move on, and we take another drug, and maybe another company is doing the same. So there's no real way to really understand why some are responding and others not, because this, the number of sample, the samples we have, sample size, is not enough. And um, having a larger scale and bringing this, the brains together, we hope that we could be able to get into another level of better understanding, this, of better understanding the disease. The other one is non-invasive molecular imaging of immune cells. We are very good at tracing what the immune cells are doing in the periphery, in the blood, but we know that resident immune cells have a particular role, and they adapt to their organ. We don't know much about it, so we are starting. The science is evolving in this area, so understanding what, how the T-regs, for example, T-regulatory cells are behaving in specific tissues in the context of a disease is extremely important. So to do so, we would like to launch a big program on non-invasive molecular imaging. So antimicrobial resistance, I'll come to that in a minute. So we have two projects. One is on clinical trial networks and accelerator of AMR, uh, our research and development. I'll go a little bit faster. Um, digital health and big data. Many projects have been identified. We'll focus on two, remote clinical trials and biosensors, digital endpoints in clinical development. And last but not least, modernization of clinical trials and regulatory pathways. Interestingly, I should have mentioned that during the workshops, some of the regulators from the FDA and the, F and the EMA were joining for that reflection. And that's one topic that came from the regulators conjunctly with the, um, with the industry and saying, we need to look at clinical trials in a different way. We have not, this, is, this has not changed over the past decades. We need to find different approaches to doing clinical trials, faster, cheaper, and more effectively. So. I think I mentioned the, um, the immunology, and you can read uh, what we want to achieve in the treatment of non-response and remission. So we will identify biomarkers, we will work as a group, you know, we will share samples, and we hopefully have enough companies to join. 
I cannot give you the numbers now, but it seems that uh, Magda, where is Magda in the room? So we are probably more than 10 companies on this one. And same for, for the other one around more than 10 companies. So it's a large number of companies committing now to, to join. We will know more uh, during the November time for that. Now, uh, the AMR. So we, we have been very good in IMI, and, and I think it's not very much known, and we probably need to do much, much more advertisement about the clinical networks that have been established. We have heard about some today. It's amazing the number of cohorts that have been put together from the different diseases areas that we are covering. But here, the idea will be to further develop a clinical trial network for antimicrobial resistance. Train the nurses, train hospitals, and being ready to execute much faster uh, clinical trials when we have some drugs uh, coming and developed by companies. The other one is a, a disruptive and interesting approach, which is an accelerator of AMR, uh, research and development. This is to boost the investment from small, and, small companies and large companies in this field that is complex. As you can imagine, resistance to uh, antibiotics, you don't have many patients, fortunately. So it makes it difficult for the business model to say how much are you going to get at the end. And so at, at, the, at, the, same time, at the same time, it's a societal, societal problem. So we need to find a way. So this is a, a proposal, and we are working on, the, on defining now how we can boost the, uh, the accelerator, and we will involve incubators and different kinds of models here. So it's still in discussion, but uh, this is really exciting, and you will hear on that from that uh, hopefully in November. So let's talk a, a bit about digital. So as I said earlier, digital is one of the big challenges for the industry, and um, this is one of the areas where we expect to have some big boost and big changes from uh, thanks to the IMI. Remote clinical trials. So rather than having the patients going to the, to the hospitals, we will have the patients staying at home and have the same kind of quality of, uh, of treatment. So we've heard about that. This, there are some pilots, so we would like to make it into a larger scale. I think more than 12, 15 companies are committed to join on this one and to define the modalities on how we are going to do that in a larger scale. Sharing best practices, coordinating efforts. So this is going to be a big change for the patients. And so for the patients who cannot go, take, the fly, take a flight, or a, a, a car or whatever to go to the hospital, they can stay at home. And we have all the tools now, digital tools that are existing, just have to validate them and align with the same standards across the industry and with the regulators. This is what's going to happen for this one. Digital, digital endpoints for clin in clinical trials. So one of them is uh, already in the call 13. It's called the Diamond Project. So you probably have heard about it. And if you have questions, you know you have been told that you can, have, you can ask questions today. So this is about developing not, not the tools, not the, the, sensor, the, the, the sensors themselves, but developing the algorithm that will allow to have a standardization about how do you integrate the data and make them available and acceptable by health authorities. Moving away from six minutes walk distance, this is one of the classical endpoints that is being used now for mobility, for example, that is not very, very good for, uh, for everyone. So using more modern tools, and this is going to be done in an expedited way. And after reflection, you know, with a lot of experts internally and externally from the companies, there's no real other way to do it than doing it with a public-private partnership and in IMI. No way to do it as fast as we can do it with IMI. So there's a lot of expectation here. So let me just finish now with the uh, clinical trials and how we can do clinical trials differently. There are, there are different models here in the clinical trial. One of them is what we have started to do with the EPAD program here for Alzheimer. When patients go to a clinical trial, you may not know or not that patients may, be, may end up in a placebo group, and that's a lottery, right? So, and that's really a, a drama for the people not being ending up, and so especially in the oncology trials or life-threatening diseases. You, by mischance, you know, be end up in the, in the, how can we minimize that? That's the point here. How can we minimize the number of patients on the placebo? And one of the ideas is to have a joint placebo group in a clinical trial with multiple treatment arms coming from different companies. That's happening already in a pilot in oncology, and so compounds are compared as they come, right? The compound comes, you know, and they, people, are, patients are treated. So you have only one placebo group, and that, build, that builds up to the point that ultimately, do you really need a placebo group is something that you could debate. That's what we would like to discuss with the health authorities. But if the compound is not working, you know, it's not working. So let's move on to something else. So this is really disruptive, and um, we are going to start by developing the methodologies on how we are going to set it up. 
and there will be there are already companies that have expressed interest in piloting that in some diseases and there are multiple diseases that are being mentioned and I don't want to mention anyone now but it's very broad so stay tuned this one is going to be interesting and uh, hopefully being disruptive and again here the focus is really for the patient's interest that's the that's the goal I'll stop here. This is, those are the four projects that we have, the four big areas that we have identified. Those, those projects will be coming for the call 14 uh, in 2018. What we will continue to do is maintain this group of six heads of R&Ds to continuously monitor what we are doing and, come and brainstorm for the next wave of projects that will come for 2019 and 2020. Okay? Thank you for your attention and happy to take questions. of Think Big, uh, really exciting uh, prospects. Any questions for Saladin? Or everybody wants to go and yeah, drink yeah, wine? Yeah. Okay, everybody go, wants to go and drink wine. But Saladin, are you staying for your drink? Sure. <laughs> you, can, you can catch so, me at the drink. So great. And uh, I, 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 just, I, I will have one question. So this is uh, very much uh, top down, coming from the heads of R&D, and that's wonderful. What about the existing mechanisms for uh, IMI through SGG and, and others? Is that going to disappear, or this is complementary, or how is that going to work out? Thank you for the question, Pierre. So this, this is the lateral. So we will maintain the, the process as, it, as, as it's moving now. We will always encourage you to come with ideas. As Magda said earlier, there's a process for the academics, you know, to also propose uh, uh, projects. So we will have enough space for those projects. So you know this budget is relatively consequent now for the next three years. So that's why we wanted to mobilize the heads of R&Ds to ensure that we are going to use the budget in a wise way. But there's no uh, in, uh, uh, issue. There's no issue for the, the the current process and the way we are going to use it. Maybe I can build up on this one. And so there were some questions about the strategic governing groups and you know how they function, the, the, the process that has been put in place is going, this is not going to change. All the projects coming from the Think Big will integrate the IMI processes. And that's what's going to happen in November with the IMI office and um, so no, no problem. It's just a parallel thinking, you know, boosted by the heads of R&Ds and then everything will go into the process that works well. 